for your time today. Can you take us right back to the beginning, first of all, please, and, and tell us how did it all start here at Tickwood? Uh, well, Holly, it was, it was really, we, we had a, a redundant farmhouse down the end of the valley. And um, I've been involved, or, you know, especially then it became more important. I was involved in doing supported living for adults with learning disability. And, uh, and I suppose the question came up, where, where do they go on holiday? Um, and Hungerdale is, is in its own valley and what is sort of tended to be the case is a lot of places say they were very happy to have um, adults with learning disability but neither the other holidaymakers or the people with learning disability felt completely at ease so it was a sort of thought we were looking into the possibility of turning that into somewhere where they could go on holiday and, and I suppose in the research that we did for um, putting in the grant to do it, um, discovered what was happening in Holland especially um, and uh, in Australia where farms were being used to bring out a lot of undiscovered potential in adults with learning disability. And I suppose the more Anna and I um, sort of delved in, we thought actually that's great because my own experiences with people 26 is where you start picking them up for supported living is then horizons had narrowed so much um, that actually possibly it was too late so we Anna and I thought actually if we go back to the beginning when they're still children if we can give them as many experiences as possible uh, hopefully one thing will actually grab their attention turn their light on and actually then encourage that so that they can actually develop a passion because one of the biggest problems with children with learning disability is everybody does everything for them they never actually explore um, and I suppose that was the sort of the start of it was actually no we want a place here where actually it's incumbent the children are positively encouraged to make their own decisions about what they want to do, where they're going to go. You know, and, and again, and, and, and as one has learnt the language more, um, it is actually get them to start risk assessing their own um, you know, pleasures or what they want to do. So are they going to go down this bank which is steep? Well, it's for them to make the decision, not someone to take them by the hand and lead them down unless they want someone to take them by the hand and so I think that was the, the, the basis of it is you know, just allow them to experience and then hopefully they'll find something that they enjoy. So from that initial idea and, and the sort of enthusiasm that began to grow, how did you get to the point where you are now with this wonderful setup of Forest School and your relationship with Sevendale? Well it was sort of we had a couple of Dutch students that came as summer students. So uh, they knew something of it, not very much, but one of them was very enthused by the idea. And, uh, and anyway, she came back and she decided to write her thesis on could you produce a, a Dutch care farm in the UK? And to do that, she needed to go and interview lots and lots of people. So together we drew up a list of the 40 people we most wanted to, to meet. And, um, and being Dutch, unlike being English, 
She'd ring them up and they wouldn't return her call. She'd ring them up again and she'd just keep going until they agreed to see her. And that was sort of, you know, we saw all and sundry. Um, but there was, you know, Sevendale we went to and it was the outdoor, we weren't seen by the headmaster at the time, but the outdoor education officer, he was enthused by this. So um, we got actually his wife's class to come just for the day to see what it was like. And they had such a brilliant time that I wanted them to commit to come once a week for a year. Because I, I didn't think, you know, if you have them intermittently, you're not going to get that. First of all, you've got to get them to relax. So they've got to understand, they've got to know and, and feel comfortable where they are. And that takes five or six times. And so they can't start exploring or, or, or experiencing until their sort of guard is down. And that's going to take time. So that was what I insisted. She thought, yep, that's what we'll do. And then, so she came um, once a week for the first year and there were 12. And, you know, and again, and it, was a, it was a wonderful experience, actually. Um, it, there's nothing nicer than somebody meeting you for once and then remembering your name and, and always being happy to see you. And it, 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 I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had no idea what I was doing. But having grown up here and being dyslexic, um, there were lots of things that I remember doing as a child, which I found confidence boosting. So we, we did lots of those sort of things. We, we grew vegetables, we did things with the animals, and we went on walks, we had a sort of nature trail, which we did three or four times, and they could see what was happening and, and noting the change. Um, and uh, again, and I suppose the, the, where, where I sort of felt, wow, this is amazing, there was one person who um, didn't speak. Um, he sort of stood there hunched and, you know, nothing and, and sort of walked like an automaton, really, and, 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 and just didn't engage at all. And it was about after he'd been there about six or seven times, suddenly he said he wanted to push the wheelbarrow. And there was complete pandemonium among, amongst the carers and the teachers because it was the first time he'd ever expressed an interest in doing anything. And it was brilliant. And I sort of developed a relationship because, well, he, he tugged on my heartstrings. And um, my last memory of him, sadly, he, you know, it, it, the way it was set up then is very different to now. But we spent a quarter of an hour discussing how we were going to take a fossil out of a rock face. And this was amazing. And then in those days when we only had one class, then parents came up. And I remember his mother um, telling me about the change that had happened. He had two sisters. He never ever recognised that they existed before he started coming. And then after about the first term, he then started to ask them, how was your day? And she was just gobsmacked at how actually he had been opened up by just being out doing something um, instead of being enclosed. So it was a sort of fun. And then um, we went to assess how the year had gone. And I had no idea what was going to be the outcome. And then um, the headmaster stood up and said, you better come with me. And I went, followed him and opened the classroom door. And he said, this is your class for next year. And then since then, it, it has grown, um, but one of the sort of the major changes was we had a, a teaching assistant called Paul, who was actually well overqualified. He was actually a lecturer in horticulture at the uh, University of Wales, uh, but he'd retired. And I knew he had an army background, but I didn't quite know what. And he was a really can-do person. And, um, and it was just sort of, you know, if he thought of something, it would happen. And, and, and together, and so together we, we, we sort of upped the game of what we were doing and it was much more adventurous. And, uh, and then he decided to retire again. And then it, the story came out when he sort of came and had supper. 
that actually, no wonder, because he'd been in the SAS for 25 years. So he had a, a very different view of health and safety um, than most teachers. So that was a sort of a, an epoch. And then suddenly after that, from being five or six classes a week, it suddenly jumped to, I think, 20. And now it is basically anyone, everyone under 16 um, does forest school once a week. And so, you know, children come here for 12 years running. And so again, so that's necessitated our thinking, because obviously if you go to the same spot for 12 years running, you're going to get pretty bored. So it, again, we, we had to expand and we were lucky enough to get various grants along the way. Um, and we have sort of, you know, I think it's nine different forest school sites now in different parts of the world. So the, there is um, variety um, and, you know, and they don't have to go to the same one every time. And, and, and so it is a very different thing. And then not as much as I would like, but they do visit the farm, especially with lambing and calving. Um, and, and that is, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful sight because it's not... We, we prefer actually the children to get, you know, get in with the lambs and, and it is just a most wonderful, wonderful sight. So you have you know, the lambs having as much fun as the children really, sort of bouncing around. But you know, sort of pictures of, of children just sitting in the, in the straw and, and lambs crawling all over them and smiling and, oh no, she went like that. Well, yes, she does. And so it, it's, it, it evolves in, in what we, we try and do. We, you know, it is pretty well, I, I, I suppose, established in terms of what was there. You know, we, we sort of, there's various adventure type things just as part of the, the background furniture so that when the children are ready to have a go, it's not a, this is a special piece of apparatus where, no, it's, oh, we've seen that lots of times. So we'll, we'll have a go. We've seen the other people doing it, so we'll have a go. So it's, you know, it's very much their place. Um, it was a sort of a wonderful experience after about three or four years that we'd been doing it. There was suddenly, a, you know, there was a, a knock on the door and there was this lady I'd never seen before in my life. And, and uh, a, a, a son, and the son I recognised. And um, she sort of asked, you know, um, John, this is John's favourite place in the world, and it's his dad's birthday tomorrow. And he wondered whether he could bring his dad here and show him. That's the thing, it's, it's to try, you know, that was, I suppose, the, the feeling that we wanted to endure, that the children would own this place because if they do then you know they can change their lives if they feel comfortable if it's theirs then it's going to make a huge huge difference to them and obviously it's very difficult to measure that difference but what sort of benefits have you seen the kids benefit from and, and how has the school fed back about the importance of, of their experience mm. here Again, I, th I think, you know, sort of one of the most amazing things for me was um, we, were, we were luckily enough selected to justify to Brussels that a European grant had been well spent. So we had to organise a symposium of various people. We had these people to come down and measure the effect of what the grant had done. And one of the most surprising things for me came out of it um, is the teacher who, who does the sort of four-year-olds um, suddenly started saying, well, you know, one of the huge benefits of coming here is a lot of my children don't speak. And um, they come here and for a lot of them, it's the first time they've ever been in the woods. So it's pretty scary stuff. And so they hang on to my legs or other carers' legs and they don't move and they stick to you like a limpet. But then after a three or four times, then they see more braver children or whatever start to wander off. And, um, and they feel then compelled to do it. And, but they need a link to their care or the teacher. And so the only way they can do that is by talking. And so she was saying that we have seen children that 
typically wouldn't start talking till they're 11 or 12 actually begin to speak to, to talk at four years old. So you know, a completely, uh, I had no idea any of this would happen. I don't think they did really. But you know, so there are huge sort of differences. And, and, but, and, and again, we've, we, we had a, a, a new head at Sevendale. And so they were reassessing everything that was being done. And, and they looked at forest school. Why were they doing forest school? And it, you know, it comes down very much to the children actually making their own decisions for once in their life. That it's not school imposing it. It's you. You actually have to make the decisions about what is happening. And so it's incredibly empowering. Um, so that is the essence of, of Forest School here. Is it is empowering the children to actually get out of their way of life which is very much imposed on them it's actually turning it around and actually no they impose themselves on life so what's happening here with children up to the age of 16 it's obviously extremely impressive but tell me about how you're involved with with people who are over 16 at the moment and and how you would really like to take that forward well yeah again i think i've bored you to death holly with, with over the years with there is such a gap post 16 in terms of actually allowing people, you know, we, we, we've, you know Sevendale is, is brilliant as a school, but then there is a, a cliff at the end of it. There's no one to actually help them carry on into adult life and actually have a, a fulfilling life. So again, we do um, sort of gardening here. Uh, normally there are four groups and, and different ages because we also do um, Sevendale have an implant at Shrewsbury College of Arts and Technology, um, so they, which is up to 26. But again, it's one of those things that there are, is a limit to how many people they can take. Um, so there are some of them who are doing um, HNDs in horticulture, and then there are others of that sort of seeing whether they want to do an HND, and then there are others who are sort of just gardening, growing things um, for, for the, you know, the fun. And then, you know, and, and, and again, and the, there's always been a level of um, making the produce into jams and chutneys and jellies and that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, and it varies. We have had, you know, sort of a number of people cooking and, and whatever and using, picking their own ingredients and then cooking and, and whatever. And then we have a, a work experience group and they get very much involved with the farm um, and, and, and get, you know, do everything. So part of their project this year is we're doing a Nissen hut, which we hope to turn into a bunkhouse. And they're getting involved in that. So it's a very satisfying project. So hopefully it will be finished um, before they leave. Um, and so they will be able to experience sleeping there themselves or actually hearing from their peers about, about how it's used. But one of the things that we've done on the farm uh, for, I suppose, probably 10 years now, is we've always had one slightly older uh, person with learning disability who comes and works with the farm manager. And uh, previously, much to the annoyance of the farm manager, as soon as they start to be useful, um, they leave and they go and get a proper job, which is what we want. So they come with very much a, a confidence deficit. And then it's just a one-to-one -one and doing everything that's being done on the farm. Um, one of the things that actually are people with learning difficulty and, and uh, it is that actually they've never been asked for empathy. And on a farm where you've got animals, well, actually the animals demand empathy. And so that is a sort of a wonderful character change in people, actually, that people are demanding. They have to do something for them. You know, they can't, you know, they have to be fed. They have to be watered. Um, you know, when lambing happens, you know, the cade lambs have to be fed. Um, 
you know, uh, lots of things where actually you have to do it. So, and you know, they get into the swing of things and actually they realize and they can give. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's endowing them with huge confidence. Um, and at the moment we, we have Ian, but I would just, you know, the, the Josh, who was the guy that we had before Ian, um, he was here for 11 months. And in the first week, they, Martin and he went out fencing. And Josh broke down in tears when he was trying to hit a staple into a post. And, uh, but, yeah, uh, you anyway, know, that, that was Josh in, uh, in, in January. Josh in December was somebody that actually felt that he deserved to be paid for what he was doing. He went off and um, got a job stacking sales at Sainsbury's. Um, but his journey didn't end there. He is now ensconced in a bike shop, which he loved bicycling. And he is a sales assistant in a bike shop. So he, you know, but whether that would have ever happened if he hadn't actually um, gained the confidence to do it, I don't know. But now we, we have Ian and um, Ian is, is probably um, one of the people with the most severe disability that we've, we've had on the farm. Um, sort of not so much physically but he he when he arrived he couldn't speak he certainly wouldn't look anybody in the eye he looked down um he was having a couple of violent episodes every week um he was totally introverted um and he has been coming now for two and a half nearly three years but his whole life has changed he's now inured in terms of what happens in lambing, he, he just goes off and he goes and does, if he thinks it's not clean enough, he will go and clean the lambing pens and everything else. So he has developed a, a, a very sort of useful trait. If he's splitting woods, which he loves, um, he will finish the pile before he, he's ready to go home. Um, you know, his, his whole mannerism, he, he, he never made a cup of tea himself before he'd come here. And it was one day, again, they do other things but fencing, but they were fencing. And they were fencing out in one of the far fields. And suddenly Ian took off. And they sort of, Martin let him go and, and, and then followed discreetly behind. And Ian headed back to the farm, went into the coffee room, and made himself a cup of coffee. And uh, anyway, which was, his carer was just gobsmacked by all this. And now Ian um, cooks, um, he goes shopping, he hated crowds, he now goes on holiday twice a year through airports. Um, it is amazing, he, he sings more than he talks. Um, but he, he, you can communicate with him now. He's now trusting enough to, to, to have a go. Um, he has, you know, again, if, if he's in a really bad form, he will have one physical episode a year now. You know, so he has tra transformed. Um, he, because of his disability, he has a car. He's not allowed to drive, and he, but he is sitting in the car when the carer arrives to take him to Tickwood. Um, he, he is, you know, he loves it, but he is just a very, very different fellow. Um, and it's fantastic. And this is what we need more of. Um, but, you know, again, we're restricted by the fact that we are a working farm. Um, and, you know, Martin, the farmer, he has to look after the animals. He has to, you know, he has to function as a farm. So um, one of the things that we need to do is get more mentors so that we can increase the number of Ian's. Because it, 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 it is staggering, the change in Ian's life. 
So what's your sort of vision for the future? What would you ideally like the farm to look like or the whole project to look like in sort of 10, 15 years, but particularly for that, for that vital post-16 and, and, and adulthood age group? Well, again, again we, we, what we're working on at the moment is, is the orangery. And, um, and the orangery is, as it sounds, it, but it is a, a sort of big, versatile building. Um, and there, there are a number of different reasons for it. Uh, the first is that we have, on average, um, 50 children here every day. Um, and there's no, reason, right, there's no reason why they all can't have their lunch here. Um, but the lunch would be prepared and served by their peers in the sixth form. So we've linked up with the National Hospitality College and they will help supervise, um, lay out the curriculum and what people have to do. So you're sort of actually providing something and, and, and you know, you're providing a cohort of people who will get jobs. Secondly, um, it is to um, provide, say, a focus for volunteers. You, know, you need somewhere where they can have a cup of coffee, where actually they can have lunch. Um, and um, that's the sort of first stage we feel, getting the volunteers to then going on and turning some of them that would like to into mentors. Because um, you know, there's farming, there's gardening, there's cooking, there's all sorts of things that we can do here. There's forestry, there's, you know, but you need the knowledge that an awful lot of um, volunteers or people close to retiring or you know, retired, they've got a lot of knowledge which they can impart to the, the kids. And, but we find and, and believe that one-to-one -one relationships add so much more, that it's not a teacher, it's actually they become friends. And, actually, and therefore, it's not just learning how to do something, it's actually learning social skills. Um, it's talking, it's developing a relationship, which again is, is so important, I think, for them to actually open their horizons and actually have a much, much more fulfilling, for, more fulfilling life. So there's that. There's also, we want to get corporate buddies um, to get them to come and use us for management meetings or away days or whatever, and therefore you need a building for, for that to happen in. Because um, there is a hurdle for employment for people with learning disability. People are scared. Um, and it becomes easier if you develop a personal relationship. So we will have all of the guys in the kitchen and hopefully others that are working in the garden who will be having their lunches there. So there will be a certain amount of interaction between the corporate buddies who, by the name, come from corporates, therefore employ people. So first off, it's the chance to get work experience, but then hopefully, ultimately, a job. But if you've broken that down and made the whole thing very personal, then I think there's more chance. It's, it's not a, a but what well, we do, can't do it. Well, yeah, but it's, it's Kath you're going to employ, mm. not anybody else. You know her um, and how she is. And, the, and then the fourth thing is um, weddings and, and wakes and, and whatever, but things where the older children, the young adults, can actually provide... Um, you know, the food and everything else for those things, which will bring in a certain amount of money, which, again, obviously goes in and, and makes the whole thing much more self-sustaining. So how far along with that wonderful sounding project are you? And, and how, how can people help? What help do you need? Well, we, we, we will shortly be uh, putting in planning permission. Um, how can people help? Well, you may, if there are any fairy godmothers out there, it would be wonderful because um, it's going to cost about half a million pounds. So it's going to be a very big fundraising job for us, um, way above anything we've done before. Um, but it, again, you may, if there aren't any fairy godmothers there, sort of below that, you know, it is actually people becoming corporate buddies and coming and, and actually getting involved in what's here. Um, we have very, you know, in terms of uh, 
pounds spent to and then pounds on admin we we don't spend any money on admin everything is is done by every the volunteers that are already here in terms of doing it. so any money we we get is actually spent directly on on what we do so you know there is room for other people to come and help you know we, we don't have all the answers you know it's a big project for us it's a, you know it's an engineering project so anybody in, in those sort of field or building or finance or whatever um, can come and help but then actually there is a huge need for mentors for people that actually would give up their time and come and take on an individual it, it I go sort of back to the early days I managed to persuade Reakin College to come here and do for a school with um, a, a class from Sevendale now that has been going now for about seven years and it, it is fantastic you watch beginning of the term or the year because they do it for the year same children there's a, a little bit of toing and froing but then actually second third week somebody comes off the bus they scan the, the Reekin people that's where I'm going and they develop the most wonderful friendships and then they go and they have Christmas lunch at Reekin and then in the summer um, they frowned upon now um, was we used to have the most amazing water fights at the end of the summer term in, in, the, in the woods um, but it was fantastic for both sides of the relationship in terms of what they got out of it and you know with the older children the sixth formers you know actually to have an older person with experience and knowledge and actually to set up a one-to-one -one relationship is, is going to be fantastic for them it will do you know it will do wonders for both of them um, you know, one of the things that as a society we're struggling with at the moment is loneliness now you know the knowledge um, and experiences of so many people who are lonely once they retire would make a world of difference to the children that come or the young adults that come here it will change their lives and at the same time actually giving something to those older people actually in, in establishing a new relationship Thank you very much indeed, Edward.